In this video, I will describe the Heathkit SB310, an international broadcast band, better known as short wave radio receiver. I'll cover the history of the radio, its features and key design aspects, and go over the front and rear panel controls and connectors. We'll also take a look inside. I'll talk about the restoration of this particular unit and then give an on-air demonstration of the radio in use. Heathkit was a company that sold electronic devices in kit form from the late 1940s through the early 1990s. They were particularly known for their extensive and popular line of amateur radio equipment. The SB series of amateur radio equipment was Heathkit's high-end range, intended to compete with expensive commercial radio equipment like that from Collins. It included receivers, transmitters, transceivers, and accessories like linear amplifiers. The SB300 was Heathkit's amateur radio receiver in the SB series. The SB310 I'm describing in this video was a shortwave version that was identical to the SB300 except it covered shortwave broadcast bands rather than amateur radio bands. Heathkit sold several models of shortwave receivers at any given time at various price and feature points. The SB310 was Heathkit's top of the line shortwave receiver during the period that it was sold. It was offered from 1967 to 1972 and like most Heathkits was sold as a kit that had to be built by the owner. It initially sold for US $267.95 which is roughly equivalent to about $1800 in today's money. It was replaced by the solid state SB313 in 1972. Here's the entry for the SB310 in the 1971 Heathkit catalog. The receiver is quite large, even for its time, weighing 17 pounds. It uses 10 vacuum tubes. The following nine frequency bands are covered. 3.5 to 4 megahertz, the 80 meter ham band. 5.7 to 6.2 megahertz, a short wave broadcast band. 7 to 7.5 megahertz, the 40 meter ham band plus short wave broadcast. 9.5 to 10 megahertz, short wave broadcast. 11.5 to 12 megahertz shortwave broadcast, 14 to 14.5 megahertz, the 20 meter ham band plus shortwave broadcast, 15 to 15.5 megahertz shortwave broadcast, 17.5 to 18 megahertz shortwave broadcast, and 26.9 to 27.4 megahertz, the CB or Citizens band. While it could be used as a ham radio receiver on the 80, 40, and 20 meter bands, it was intended as a short wave receiver. It came with a 5 kilohertz filter that was suitable for AM signals. There was an optional 400 hertz CW filter and two versions of 2.1 kilohertz single sideband filters that improved the selectivity for these amateur radio modes of operation. There was also an optional kit to convert the 11 meter CB band to 13 and 15 meter short wave bands. The design featured Heathkit's Linear Master Oscillator, or LMO, which provided linear frequency tuning over a 500 kHz range on each band. It included a 100 kHz crystal calibrator for checking dial calibration. Not unusual for receivers of this type, it did not include a built-in speaker. You could use any 8 ohm speaker. Heathkit offered the SB600 speaker in a matching case. It sold for about US $20. I have one here that I purchased on eBay. The case only contains a speaker, although it could be used to also house a power supply used by some Heathkit ham radio equipment. While many Heathkit amateur radios required an external power supply, the SB310 has an internal power supply. The SB310 came with a copy of the World Radio TV Handbook, a guide to short wave stations that's still published today on an annual basis. Here is my copy from the year 2000. Let's take a look at the front panel controls. At the top left is an S meter indicating received signal strength calibrated in standard S units and decibels. The function switch controls power, standby or operate mode and the crystal calibrator. If used with a transmitter, you could switch the receiver to standby during transmit, 
or use the rear panel mute connector to control operation versus standby mode from the transmitter or an external transmit receive relay. AF gain is the volume control and when pulled out will activate the noise blanker, although there's no indication of this on the front panel. The AGC switch is for the automatic gain control and can be set to off, fast, or slow. The pre-selector control is adjusted for maximum gain on the selected band and location within the band. It has a standard quarter inch headphone jack. The mode switch allows to select between AM, CW or Morse code and upper or lower sideband reception modes. Without the optional additional filters, CW and upper sideband settings are identical and lower sideband is not usable. You can receive lower sideband signals in the CW or upper sideband modes. The band switch selects one of the nine available bands listed by frequency. The RF gain control is typically used to adjust the receiver gain when AGC is turned off. Tuning uses the large knob. Frequency is read from the upper slide rule dial and the lower circular dial. You take the frequency of the band, add the 100 kilohertz value from the upper dial, and then the tens of kilohertz on the rotating dial. For example, the current setting is on the 7 megahertz band. The upper dial is between 1 and 2, and the lower dial at 44, indicating a frequency of 7.144 megahertz. The dial is linear and quite accurate. You can calibrate to the nearest 1 kilohertz by tuning, turning on the crystal calibrator and moving the dial pointer calibration knob. On the rear panel, we have the power connector. I soldered on a heavy-duty modern line cord since I did not have a power cable with the cheater type plug to fit this radio. Then there are four RCA or phono jacks. One for the antenna, which on this receiver has been modified to be a BNC connector. And a jack for the mute function mentioned earlier. There's a spare jack, which is unwired. The jack labeled Hi-Fi Out can be used to connect to an external amplifier, for example. A 500 ohms output is typically used for high impedance headphones. And finally, there's an 8 ohm speaker output for a standard loudspeaker. Let's take a look inside. The top is hinged, giving easy access to much of the circuitry and adjustments needed for alignment. Construction uses two printed circuit boards, as well as a significant amount of under the chassis point-to-point -point wiring. There's a total of 21 coils that are adjusted during alignment. There's a local oscillator crystal for each of the nine bands. The linear master oscillator is a factory sealed unit. This is the 100 kilohertz crystal for the calibrator and here are the crystals for the CW upper sideband and lower sideband modes. I added the optional lower sideband crystal. This black unit is the standard 5 kilohertz AM filter. The optional filters for single sideband or CW would be installed here. This particular unit was bought from a fellow Canadian ham radio operator on eBay. As received, it was working and very clean. The cover appears to have been recently repainted. It doesn't have the optional single sideband and CW filters. This was quite common if the radio was intended primarily for short wave listening. The rubber feet were missing. I made some from some rubber stoppers. The power cord was also missing, so I soldered in a heavy-duty cord. I downloaded a copy of the manual from the internet and read it over. I added the crystal for lower sideband mode, although the best lower sideband reception requires the optional filter. The power function on the function switch was not working. It's a combined rotary wafer switch and power switch. Getting a new switch is almost impossible. I was able to rig up a micro switch in such a way as to be controlled by the rotor of the function switch. 
Provided that the Gorilla Glue holding the switch stays in place, it should do the job. I ran through the alignment procedure using a signal generator, digital multimeter, and oscilloscope. The alignment was pretty good, I just touched it up. Let's power up the radio and see what we can pick up. It's evening here in Ottawa, Canada, which is a good time to pick up signals on the 49 meter band, for example. As you can see, we can pick up lots of commercial short wave stations. We should be able to pick up some Morse code and single sideband amateur radio signals on the 40 meter band. Maybe we'll have better luck on 20 meters. And on 15 megahertz, we should be able to pick up the frequency and time reference signal WWV.
In summary, the SB310 is still a pretty good receiver by today's standards. It's nice looking, and like Heath kits of this vintage, it's quite easy to repair and maintain unless some unique mechanical part gets damaged. Its main drawbacks are its size, weight, and power consumption. It's not continuous coverage and has no digital display, although this could be added. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please check out my other videos on vintage radios and test equipment.